Hello again, everybody. Sorry we've been uh, away for quite some time, but um, we've both been busy, especially Danny, seeing as he's got his own business and I don't really have my own business. So it's uh, a bit easier for me and a bit harder for him. And don't forget, we are kind of in two different countries. How have you been anyway, Danny? Yeah, pretty good. As you said, busy. Uh, dealing with all yeah. sorts, as I'm sure you can relate to. Oh, God, I absolutely. I've been busy too. I've been doing mechanical stuff lately, which is a little bit weird because I don't normally do mechanical stuff. As you know, I've not picked up my power probe in about five weeks. I've been doing timing chains and all that type of garbage, what I used to do when I was younger, you know. I've got tennis elbow. It's killing me. I saw some of your posts on the Banos jobs that you've been doing. Yeah, I've, that's done and dusted. He picked it up after it's five years I've been to different garages. It's been going on for five years, this problem. And when he picked it up, the only thing he said was, oh, it still has a problem when it's hot starting. It was something and nothing, basically. But no thanks. Like, oh, you've sorted the problem out after multiple garages have ripped me off over the years and haven't fixed it. And that's is what I've just launched this new um, sub stack. It's what it's all about because on LinkedIn, I can't say anything because it's all kind, you're all kind of like censored. So I've just wrote a few things on Substack because, you know, these customers, they don't appreciate a damn thing you do. That was, for me, the last final straw. You know, they're just, uh, I'm sure you must experience that, Danny. These ungrateful people, you do them a favour and save them a bit of money. Does that happen to yeah, you, well, Danny? I had, I had an altercation with one recently. Who, yes. Um, there was a guy who was desperate to uh, have his Audi seen to. Um, apparently, he'd been to several places and nobody had found the problem. And I told him that there would be a charge for the diagnosis. And he uh, he tried to dictate how the diagnosis would go. So I said, I'm sorry, I uh, I can't take this job on. I have a bad vibe about this one. No, mate. Uh, yeah, and when when they say, oh, yeah, I want you to do this, this, and this, and you feel like saying, well, what the bloody hell do you bring it to me for? If you want to fix it, fix it yourself. Why are you bringing it to me? I used to work with a bloke, Danny. Can't mention his name, obviously. It's a shame I can't really, isn't it? But he had a small place, and he was an horrible sod. But he was a very good businessman. And it was the last place I worked before I came came here. Uh, I worked there for like about three weeks. It was I worked there for such a short time, I didn't even put it on my seat. And uh, he was a horrible person. But when people would come, he would say to them, no, listen, I'll tell you what you're going to have. We're not going to fit these uh, cheap parts. We're going to fit Bosch because I'm a Bosch gas service centre. And they were like, yes, okay, no problem. It's the only person I've ever seen who actually tells people how it is. Nowadays, it's all this liberal crap, and it's like, oh, yes, sir, whatever you want. Yes, we'll sack the mechanic, sir, for leaving a thumb, oil thumbprint stain on your lovely Mercedes leather interior. That's how it is, isn't it? Awful industry. God, awful industry. That's why I got into it. I don't know, really, but if people read my Substack article, you'll understand why I got into it. Yeah. One of them things, I guess. Yeah. I suppose it, I, I've not really been in an environment where... I've uh, had to be, um, I suppose, um, wary of what I say. It, being self-employed, you, you, you're the, you know, you're the only person point of contact. So I suppose yeah. um, a little bit more freedom as to how I converse with certain customers when there's a little bit of resistance between the two of us. Um, but I can understand entirely of uh, what businesses and you know organisations uh, how they suffer, and um, it's a shame that um, I know myself uh, some organisations who don't really have the staffs back, which is a real shame because without them, what would be the point? Exactly, and you know what always annoys me is like when I've been working in Finland, not so much where I work now because it's totally different, but when I worked in Lapp, a BMW dealer, all these, they were like, when you work at a BMW dealer, it's 100 times worse than working for an independent because all the customers come with like snooty. They've got a one series, it's eight year old and it's not worth that much money, but they think they're like special because they're in a BMW dealer. Really, it's like that. And they always bring presents for the service advisor or the manager. But yeah, another one is like people, uh, they bring things, they bring gifts for service advisors. They don't, well, what do you think service advisor's done? He's booked you the job in. He's, he's listened to the, the crap what you've spoke, which basically is nothing like what's really wrong with the car, but you always try and give you like a Bible chapter and verse of what's wrong with it and how to fix it. Then they've took your money and give you your keys and you've gone. So why give them a present? Gift present for the poor guy who came at six o'clock in the morning, did a bit of overtime just so we could catch up with his workload. That's just the way they are. But they pay our wages, nothing you can do about it. 
but they should start thinking a bit more. Like, you know, it's not the easiest job in the world. And, you know, if you, you know, bring something, bring something for us, you know, bring us a little, uh, I don't know, toy car, BMW or something, something fun and happy we can stick on my toolbox, you know. It's unbelievable, isn't it? Sat on their arse all day, service advisor, get everything. That's how it is. Do you think, do you think it was um, you're in the, in the back most of the time out of view of the customer? Maybe, yeah. But I've, listen, I've worked at places where, in the good old days, it did be hanging around purposely to ask you to do a foreigner on the car. And if foreign, if people are listening who aren't from England, foreigner means a job on the side, basically, which is uh, obviously not taxable. I never did that, of course. I always paid my taxes, naturally. But they do do that. That's the only time they hang around. Uh, most of the time, it's just they're just. Uh, they, but they always blame the mechanic as well, don't they? So, like, if they never bring you anything, they bring gifts for all these weasels, like these these managers and service advisors. The mechanic they never bring out. All they bring is. Uh, Headaches. It rolls downhill, doesn't it? You know, since you serviced my car last week, um, there's a squeak at 100 miles an hour. Well, I can't do that because it's the limit 70 in the UK on motorways and 60 on dual carriageways. But when I do 100, you know what I mean? Well, I never drove your car at 100. But I, all I did was um, change your windscreen wipers, you know, the blades, and they're perfect. I would insist you put some other blades on. So we put some other blades on, and there you go. The noise is still there, and it ends up being something like gear stick was loose or something. The gear trim was loose around the gear stick. That's what the customers uh, speak to mechanics for, nothing else. Foreigners, jobs on the side, and to moan at them or to lie and say the wheels fell off because they loosened the wheel bolts and blame you so they could get free service. Different for you, though. Self-employed, yeah, totally different. I would, yeah, I mean... In some instances, I suppose it, it it's got its pros and cons, because um, you know you, you've only got yourself to look after, but you are also responsible for everything that uh, everyone talks to you about. So you know there's no escaping if you, uh, you know, can't be bothered to speak. Yeah. Somebody. I think the hardest thing for me, I'm, I'm not sure about you, but it's when the customer has done a bit of research and um, the, there are occasions now, I'm sure you'll understand, where you can anticipate the fault um, from a brief description of what the customer might have explained to you. And, you know, with respect, you, you've been in the field for a long time you don't necessarily need to know what forums you've been reading to to uh, check whether this part is faulty or you've been told that this part's quite a common issue especially when you've already got an idea of how to approach the situation in your mind and then the customer yeah. oh um, i'm just having a look at this yeah. they can be really useful because um i look at them as their experts in their own right, because they love the car. They might have, they say they have a 5 Series F10 or something. They know everything about that car, probably more than I do, but they don't know how to fix it, right? But they do seem tend to have the same type of faults, especially on BMW. You have a run where you have the same faults, like these EGR coolers and stuff like that, when they were leaking and setting them on fire up motorway. <laughs> I just saw one once on fire in Finland, but that's a different story. But yeah, I do get that. I get it a lot. But I listen to them. Sometimes I listen to them, but like, the one thing I love me the most is like when you get in a car and they have like this A4 sheet of paper and then it's actually written on both sides. It's not just one A4. A4 is a big piece of paper. It's actually, it says in Finnish, turn over in Finnish, it says. And you turn over and it's repeated ad, ad infinitum on the other side, like what's wrong and what I think it might be and all this business. And um, in the end, I don't, I don't really read them because I have to translate it into English anyway. But sometimes they stick them on steering with a bit of tape so, so it's like pertinent. So you definitely have to, you, you don't miss it kind of thing. Or even better ones, one of them stuck, stuff, stuck it on the seatbelt. So as I put the seatbelt on, a piece of paper come with it, like <laughs> what was wrong with the car and all that business. Okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> hey, I'll tell you a funny one, yeah. Danny. Um, I'm just thinking the other day, um, just some of the things, what like the requests. What I had one job once where it was in for an oil and filter service. This is giving you an example of mentality of customers, right? This is just unbelievable. It come in for an oil and filter change, and the guy said, or well, well, the service advisor told the guy, yeah, listen, we've done oil and filter change in your car, but your sump pan is leaking. It's a little bit corroded, but it's actually the gasket has failed on it. 
And uh, we've checked your crank pressure. There's no problem with your engine. It's just an old, it's like a 15-year-old car. We just need to basically sort it out, can And uh, you know what he said, the guy, this was years ago when I was in UK, he said, why the hell didn't you change it as part of the service? And like, we were like speechless, like what? You want us to like drop your subframe, take, spend several hours taking your sump pan off, not asking you and then charging you for it. He said, no, it should be free. It should be part of the service. You found an oil, oil leak. You've changed my oil. Why didn't you do that? And we were like, are you mental? Five hours work and you're paying us for half an hour, 80 quid, and you want you want us to do that for free? He said, yes, you should do it for free. Absolutely. How do I know you didn't cause the problem? I said, cause the problem? You've got a 15-year-old car, mate, with a rotten sump and gaskets gone. So really, you probably need a new sump as well. And that's the sort of stuff you're up against. I couldn't believe that years ago. That's nothing. I'm sure you've had them things, Danny, people doing that. I've had instances where um, a car has had uh, an electrical failure. Say one of the doors for the central locking has a broken wire in it, for example. And then the customer will say, I only took it in for a service three months ago. <laughs> and I've never really understood whether they are playing on that or if they really don't realize that the differences between you know what's involved in a service and anything else that goes wrong from that point onwards i, I don't know what your thoughts are uh, are on about it but um when you look at it in another um example say your house and your microwave stops working um, and then you call, I don't know, you go to Curry's and say, oh, you only just serviced my uh, washing machine uh, three months ago. You know, how how's the microwave stopped working? I don't know. I don't know how, I don't know whether customers uh, know it and they're just trying to pull a fast one or if they really feel like the car is just its own entity and, it's just made of one part. Yeah, probably. Because that's the thing. Customers don't really know cars. That's why they bring them to us in the first place. It's up to us to try and maybe educate them. But like, you've got to like use like you've got to speak to some customers the way you speak to a four year old child, haven't you? You've got to use basic language because it's you know it's it's not easy. I had a call today about an unrelated matter, and it was something technical, not in my field, and I was like struggling to understand the terminology. And I actually realised today in that call with something unrelated to our industry but technical nonetheless that actually is difficult for customers and we should make an extra effort to get them to understand if they understand a lot of them they might be all right paying for stuff but if they don't understand maybe that's why they have these price objections you're always going to get these who don't, don't pay anyway but most customers are decent aren't they and they do pay our wages so we should should be respectful towards them in that sense yes yeah, some of them like the last episode told you about that uh, asian guy whose car blew that garage up that was unforgivable I mean, I laugh about it. I shouldn't laugh because it was tragic, but I'm sure they got their insurance payout and I think they're probably back up and running. But yeah, there's, there's loads of instances like that. I mean, I've had a few run-ins with customers, to be honest. Um, but we could we could sit here all night talking about stories, but we should probably talk about some industry news, really. I mean, I'm not really keeping up with the industry, but I do know one thing, that electric cars aren't doing so good, are they? I've got one. Prices have dropped through the floor. Yeah. Talk about that, to be honest. <laughs> Well, yes, I had a feeling in China, X. No, no, in China, Xpeng have got a new system. You just drive into a bay, it jacks your car up. It's all robotized. It pulls your battery out and changes it in three minutes. Then off you go, six hundred kilometer range again. So you, I guess you just lease the batteries. Yeah, I saw it the other day on the internet. It was absolutely amazing. So that's the way hydrogen will go. You'll pull it, and it'll pull pull the module out, or you pull it out yourself and stick a new hydrogen fuel cell in, and away you go. So, no, I love my little i3. I'm just making a video on my YouTube channel now about when the cam bus failed on it after it only had it about three or four months or something. But um, for me, for going to work, it's great. Other than that, in winter, it's a pain charging the damn thing every, literally every day. Um, but other than that, it's champion, really, and it is the way to go. I'd never go back to having a filthy, oily diesel. Great, comfy, lovely, dead easy, 1,000 kilometres range, 5 Series, but, you know, all the hassle grease and oil leaks and all that business. The only thing I have to worry about with my car is the bearings and the transmission, that's it. You know, really, to be and Okay, some battery modules wearing out, hopefully not yet in a few years, but for me, quite positive EV ownership, I suppose. 
I don't think you're quite convinced you're a motorbike guy, aren't you? I do like my bikes. Uh, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm on the fence about EV, to be honest with you. Um, but to be honest, I hadn't heard of uh, this new uh, process that is happening in China. I mean, if it if it's sustainable, it's it's not a bad solution. Because if you're saying it takes about three minutes for the car to go three in, minutes. get jacked up and battery replaced, I mean, it, it can take you five or six minutes to fill your car up with petrol anyway. You know, mm. by the time you're done, you go and pay inside the petrol station. Exactly. I mean, it's a great thing. I think it is, yeah. Some people on LinkedIn were saying it weren't, but I think Chinese have got the right idea, really. I mean, I've heard about some of these Chinese cars. They, they suppress all the information. There's a lot of them setting on fire, these Geely's and all this, but not Geely's, another brand. It might be Geely, I can't remember, but there's a couple of them been setting on fire randomly. But you have to bear in mind, biggest country population in the world, really, that and India together. So I guess there will be incidences because they've got a lot more cars than what we have. So you're going to have, how many really is there? I don't, it's probably just fake news trying to trash China again, isn't it? You know, I don't think they've got as many as, I think we've had them in the UK with the European made cars anyway. So I wouldn't put too much faith in the newspaper reports in my eyes. That's the way I think anyway. I like China. Yeah. Yes. A few, bit of thing, a few things going on with China at the moment, but at the end of the day, They've got some good products, I think. I think they've gone a long way to go yet, but they'll get the, they'll be the biggest car producing company in the world soon. I mean, like mainstream in Europe, I mean. They're definitely coming to Europe. We've got MG already. We've got this uh, van, Maxus. Maxus is now making, I saw one in the other day, and I was thinking a four-wheel drive, like Range Rover type thing. They've got the capacity to do it. Why not? Bravo, China. Hope there's Chinese watching, and they'll uh, enjoy me. Positive comments about China, basically. Over to you. You never know. You might get a job offer in China now. I might do. And I'll tell you what I'm doing now. Just a quick interlude here, Danny, if that's all right. A couple of weeks ago, when we were planning this second episode, I made some notes because I knew I'd forget. So let's just have a quick look at them. Sausage bean casserole, large onions, almond milk. Oh, that was my shopping list for last week. So it's, ah, here we are. Things for next podcast. Ah. I just thought I'd bring this up, Danny, if it's all right. How about this one here now? What do you think about... Let's just go through all these because they're fun. How about filthy cars? How do you deal with filthy cars? And when I say filthy, I mean so filthy that, you, you know, you need to clean yourself. You need to put a seat cover on your overalls so that you're not filthy, not the car. How do you feel about that? I'm quite <laughs> used to it, to be honest with you. I suppose uh, once upon a time, it would have bothered me. Um, but... I suppose I try to see the positives in it. It's so dirty that if you uh, break something or make it dirty, you don't <laughs> notice. Yeah, just grind it in with your thumb, don't you? <laughs> you know, I used to work with a scouser years ago. He was a bit of a lunatic. No, he was absolutely nutter. He used to always glue his tooth in with super glue when it used to fall out his false tooth. He was a nutter. And uh, he used to always get end of a screwdriver. It's a good tip. Get a snap on plastic, hard plastic snap on screwdriver, the old school ones. And when you make a bit of damage on them, you just grind the plastic in and blend it in with snap on. It's absolutely, it's like a crayon. It's amazing. It's best tip ever. So that's one thing you can, you can learn from, from that guy. I've got loads here. How about customs when they bring, well, not so much to you because you're going to them, but when they bring me a car and it's got a problem with the engine and they know I'm going to road test it and there's no fuel in. It's like five kilometers range. You're making it now my problem. I've got to go and get a fuel card, get the receipt in minus 20, whatever it is, get out the car, fill it up, bring the receipt back, don't lose it. I hate that. That's one of my biggest pet hates. How about you? Is it a big pet hate for you? Well, yes. Um, but a another one that's probably equally as uh, frustrating is a car that has no insurance or tax and they have an engine management fault which requires road testing. Yeah. And you get there, they said, oh, it's not taxed and insured. It's like, well, I'm only covered to drive a car that is taxed and insured. So, you know, that's no good to me. So uh, there's, You're there's the one in trouble. I can do. I, I end up, mm -hmm. yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah it's, it's not worth Absolutely. It. How about this one? But the almost empty is annoying, yes. Oh, it's just, uh, yeah, and it, it just annoys me that. And then they moan about how much you've spent topping it up. How about this one here now? If I had a girlfriend <laughs> called Carly, 
<laughs> which I don't. I'm, I'm married, of course. But if I had a girlfriend called Carly, because it is a name of, you know, these girls in England, these like these council house types. Oh, like Carly, love. You know, that type. How about when customers use Carly, that, that tool, Carly, you know, that garbage, Carly, what you can do all this uh, programming, what you would need to use, like, other professional tools for. And, like, I sold a car once. F10, no, I nearly sold it. He messed me around. He come, he said, oh, can I plug me car in just to check it? I said, of course you can, mate, no problem. He said, you've got like, hundreds of fault codes in this car. I said, listen, those are bullshit fault codes because they don't really exist because Carly gives you a load of bullshit information that just makes people like you panic thinking you've got fault with your car when there ain't no fault with your car. So I hate Carly. I would never recommend it. Same with that bimmer code or bummer code, as I call it. Just throw it all in the bin. A waste of time. It's all right for reading the odd fault code, but like you read it, it's like, then you plug in Autologic or Think Tool or even Ister. Code doesn't even exist. It doesn't even exist, mate. So I hate that. Yeah, I've used my Carly and I've got this fault code. I need to know what it means. What does it mean? It don't mean nothing, mate. Come into my workshop, please. The, if it's not on Ister or, or, or Autologic, it ain't a fault code, but you know the type of customers, what I mean, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I, I have uh, a few of those. I'm, I'm actually quite good friends with them but um you do sort of have to remind them of uh how not to rely on these really low priced mm. uh you know code re i wouldn't even call it a diagnostic machine it's just a you know a basic code reader like, I'm, I'm, aw I'm aware of carly but i've not actually seen one um in the flesh so I don't know what they're like, but from your description, for coding, they're not. Very... No, it's for coding. It's quite good. You can you can do like fancy things like you know turn on American style uh, indicator markers and all that. You know all this type of coding stuff like uh, you know M sport display and sport displays. So in that sense, it's great if you think about it. But it's these people who think when they've got these phantom fault codes, which this pile of crap picks up, that there is a fault. So that's why I don't like it. Basically, how about this one? How about? Uh, yeah, this is my favourite now. A customer comes to you and it says on the job card, one hour max, then call customer, or one hour waiting customer. Waiting customer is the best. Then you plug it in. They've got 75 fault codes. They've clearly been doing it for six months to a year, but they now only want to bring it when it's minus 20 in winter, and it only does it in summer when it's hot usually. That's the other thing. But, like, uh, you know, they expect you to do it in, in an hour. Well, well, you've got fault codes, so you must know what's wrong with it. There's 75 of them, mate. Most of them are because there's some serious problem with a unit or a wiring. And, you know, give me five hours, six hours, leave it with me for the day, take a courtesy, go, oh, no, I'll go somewhere else. Rubbish. That's what I get sometimes. They don't understand why it'll take me several hours just to understand what's going on. It must happen to well, you, though. Good luck taking it somewhere else to get an hour. Hmm? Um, it, it's happened on occasions. Um, I, I used to, I, I did a short stint at, um, stint at Car Giant in West London. Um, and we used to have a customer waiting job card as well. So we'd get, there were yellow job cards and that's how we knew that they were customer waiting jobs. But in all honesty, um, our manager was very understanding and he, he, uh, he called a spade a spade, so and he he would quite oh, welcomely nice. accept you to speak to him back in that way too. He, he actually respected you more if you spoke your mind. And we'd go there, we'd, we'd give it a scan. We we used um, Auto Logic at Car Giant as well back in twenty, and um, we'd see fifteen to twenty four codes. A lot of them are current and not history codes. And we just say, look, mm. this is not a customer waiting type of diagnostic. So you either let them know to tell the customer that they're going to be here for a while, or they reschedule it for a day where they can leave the car and go. Yeah, don't yeah. mess around with the waiting ones, to be honest. They, they need to be told uh, how it is if, if you know that the job is going to be difficult. Sure. Yeah, that's how it is, though, to be honest, for me. I get a lot of them customer waiters, but in Finland it's different because uh, the environment and everything, it's just such hassle trudging through the snow to get public transport, I can promise you. So I do understand that. But in the UK, it was just, like ridiculous, you know, like, oh, I can't be bothered. I'm going to wait. Like, right, you've got one hour to do it. You know, what is it, like Quick Fit or something? I didn't work at Quick Fit as a young lad because precisely I didn't want to be rushed. 
changing tyres and exhaust like some trained chimpanzee all day. So I give that a miss, basically. Of course, I don't. If, is Quick Fit still in business, by the way? Does it still exist? Quick Fit. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, they're still around. Yeah. Wow, that's amazing. I think they 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 do MOTs now. I don't know if they did when you were uh, in England. No. But yeah. No, they were not really. Just. Do- Dark cave dwellings, really, with like GPS characters in, but probably it's quite reasonable nowadays. I don't know. No, it was all right. Quick fit, quick fit was all right. It was good price and they were fast. What more do you want? Doctor experts in tires and exhausts. Who can knock it? Legends, basically, in my eyes. How about this one, Danny? Yeah, here's a good one. How about when the customer comes to you and says, I've got all these fault calls, then they delete them? And don't take a copy, and it's sporadic. So, like, it might come back next Christmas, or it might come back next Tuesday. And then they go, oh, "Why can't you fix it?" Sir? Because you deleted the fault code. So, how am I going to fix it? I've not got a crystal ball. Look, my microphone's a crystal ball. Can you say? Mm, Absolutely. Yeah. Your muscle sensor is broken. I mean, what it they don't realise is that the fault, the fault codes are time stamped. You know, if you're using ISTA or mm. BCDS, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. They're time stamped, so it's very crucial, especially with intermittent faults, that you don't clear the code because you want to see the time stamp, the engine load at the time, the coolant temperature. You know, there's there's a there's a vast amount of um, information on a time stamp. I agree with you, mate, and that's why I don't like them doing it. Another one, one last one, a quick experience I had a couple of years ago when I worked um, at a dealership. It was Nissan. And I had one customer come in once. I, I remember this story the other day and I thought, I'll tell it you because you don't know it and it'll be quite funny for you. This is a one of them fault calls. <laughs> Not fault calls, one of these stories that'll make you laugh. So it was something like a Nissan Almira. And he said, I've got a squeak. It's some sort of a squeak or groaning noise. He said, but it's on my left front wheel. But it only does it uh, in sunny and dry weather and only on Tesco car park and only on Tesco car park in the centre of the city. And only when I do a left-hand turn. And if you go in any other Tesco, it doesn't do it. It only does it on Tesco car park in summertime. So you can imagine what time of year it was when he brought it to me. It wasn't summer. It was winter. Snow. Even though we don't get much snow, there was snow everywhere and it was wet. And he, he said, I says, well, how long's it been on this? He said, about 12 months. I said, so you've waited 12 months and you brought it to me in winter. What? I said, what do you want me to do? You've said that it only does it when it's dry. He said, yeah, it does. Only when it's dry. I said, but it's pouring down out there with sleet and snow and rain. I said, yeah, but can you just have a look at it? Anyway, I took it on and went out wrong with it. Then he was moaning, saying it was warranty. It's warranty. It's warranty. I want to see the manager. I want to see the manager. And when we had that Scottish one I told you about last time, do you remember? Yeah, and he come out and he went, <laughs> he went, Jesus Christ, I'm eating my dinner. What do you want? And he said, <laughs> said oh, car's making a noise and this mechanic here's not been very helpful at all. He said, listen, I've been listening to your conversation with my door open. Guy says, your mechanic says that it only does it in summer. You says it only does it in summer. So why the hell are you here at the top of winter? He said, I've been thinking about it all year and I've Luke. decided to come because yeah, cause my warranty's running out soon. So, I, you know, I don't want to be in trouble and have to pay for it myself. He said, how long have you got left on your warranty? He said, oh, it runs out in January. And then in the end, the guy just like, he was moaning. And this manager said, he said, he said, Johnson, change every bit of suspension on that vehicle. I said, you can't because it's Nissan. We need pretty authority for something. He says, I don't care. We'll take it out of our budget just to get this morning bastard away from the dealership. <laughs> the guy was just looking at him like that because he was swearing at him like, you know. He said, right, we're going to give you a whole new front left end. Is that all right with you? He said, oh, champion, champion. Thank you very much. And in the end, it did fix it. It was a some brush, just a bad problem with a bush. A bush had been twisted wrong when they built it or something or someone had been tampering and it had been put in. And it was put in at the wrong angle. So when the bolt was in and the car level dropped down off the ramp, it twisted the bush. But it was all full of mud and crap. You couldn't yeah. see it. But that's what it was. But that was good because it resolved yeah. the situation. But it was just dead funny. Like the, the, the mind of some people, you know. It's crazy, isn't it? Crazy. This whole he, job's um, crazy, he Danny. He passed away, didn't he? No, he's not, he's not dead, I don't think. No, that was, that was uh, the old, that was the, the younger one who was the, the uh, dealership general manager. You know, like the general managers, do you remember? General managers. He, the other guy was the service manager, the, the Scottish one, who was, they were both good blokes, really, yeah, to be yeah. honest. Uh, but the, the one who died was a cracking bloke, but I think there was just too much stress in the job. And I'll just give you another quick one. Actually. We'll wrap it up shortly because, uh, you know, 
we've made this podcast a bit yeah, late and it's had two hours ahead of you so no it was getting good but next one will be even yeah, better so but um, you must be we, quite tired. i've been uh, working all day on my sub stack and uh, on this youtube channel oh man it's just you know it's a nightmare there's just so much it's like a full-time job but i'll just give you a quick one what i just it came to my mind the other day i worked at a place once and we were looking at this used car sales car they'd bought it from an auction they used to buy used cars for market. it was a peugeot i think it was a 206 or something or maybe a 307 or something like that no not 206 207 or a 307 and it was quite new but there was something fishy about it and i don't remember why we did it but we pulled the roof lining down and when we pulled the roof lining down from the back left to the front right the roof was a different color so the roof was in two triangles because what the, the car had rolled on its left front crushed the A-pillar, damaged it completely. They cut the A-pillar off and welded welded an A-pillar and a roof off another vehicle to it. <laughs> it was like metallic gold on right and metallic metallic green on left. And at this place, which I'm, I'm never wow. going to mention because I could get in trouble, I said to the general manager, not this guy, a different one, I said, listen, uh, you've bought a cut and shot. You've bought a cut and shot. You can't sell this piece of shit because it's dangerous. <laughs> he said, we can't go back. Stick that roof lining back with super glue and stick it on for God. Some bugger bought that. Some other bought that guy and they're probably still on the road now. No idea. I mean, the repair must have been amazing because to join two parts together on an angle like that, it was crazy. Could put the welding was proper dodgy. It was like that bird shit welding, you know. And I was like, you know, it's got like <laughs> ten kilograms of filler. It's got ten kilograms of filler on roof. Roof didn't flex. Roofs flex, they're only thin, aren't they? They flex, boing, boing. This didn't flex. It just went yeah. boom, boom, boom. It was like hitting a piece of plasterboard. Hitting a piece of plasterboard. <laughs> yeah. But anyway, that's just part of fun of the uh, mid-2000s in the UK when everything was a bit dodgy and now it's a lot more strict, I guess. Probably still aren't rolled that. Well, yes. I mean, when you said a, a 206 or a 207, it, it probably mm. is. Well, I see plenty Roll of seven, I think. And, uh, yeah. 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 I, th I think it was a 207, mate. I'm pretty sure it was a 207. Right, we'll have to wrap it up now, I'm afraid. Uh, next time, we'll uh, probably talk about a few more topics related to the industry. We can't keep bashing these customers like this because I've given too much of a bashing and I've also given managers and service advisors a bit of a bashing. However, on my Substack, which is all about this industry, I'm pretty damn sure. By the way, my Substack is called Letters from a Car Mechanic and uh, it's I'm transferring everyone from LinkedIn over to that. So if, if you're watching this podcast, letters from a car mechanic on the Substack app or on basically Windows PC application, whatever. So that's what we're going to do. We're not going to bash these people too much and we'll come up with some lovely topics next time. And we may even, Danny, I don't know if you think this is a good idea. We'll probably get someone to call in on the next one. We'll have a, a good old three-way chat about the industry. What do you think? I think that would be marvellous. I think it would be marvellous also. There's a, there's a few there's a few, few people on LinkedIn who I, I'm sure would be more than happy to get involved. Oh, yeah. I've got I've got Tom Denton to mind, definitely, but we'll have to be on our best behaviour because Tom's a, a real gentleman of the automotive industry. He's actually a, a legend and a giant, so we must um, only talk about sensible things if Tom comes on. I'm pretty sure, Tom, we could twist Tom's arm to come on here. And I do like Tom. I've met him a few times and uh, I wouldn't be where I am without him, actually, especially when it comes to my writing side of things because Tom's definitely sort of been a motivating factor and an inspiration for me. So. Right. So anything else you want to say, Danny, before we end this session? No, I don't think so, no. Until the next right. time. Right. Difficult. Until next time. Been a bit difficult tonight because I'm on like... Uh, the worst internet you can ever imagine. I'm on 4G internet because I live in the middle of a forest and it keeps dropping off. So there's like a delay, but it does save the local machine on this podcast, which should be pretty good. But it's difficult. So if, if, if anyone, whoever's watching this, because it's the first time we've done it on video, if it's a bit jittery, it's because there was a bit of a problem with the internet. But, you know, that's life. It is what it is. I'm sure it's, it's good laugh and it's all entertaining and it's better than some automotive podcasts, which are basically just boring garbage. So hopefully... People will like ours much more and they'll download it. So make sure you download it and leave some reviews as well because, you know, we're not going to grow without reviews. If you like it, review it and leave a good one. If you don't like it, don't do it. Don't come back, no problem. But if you like it, please review, review five star. Right, until next time, see you all later. Good one.